Hello everyone, and welcome to this uh, GitWorks webinar on how to slam with LidaView. Uh, thank you for being so many with me uh, today, and uh, I'm glad uh, to, to see that all of you are here, and, um, and, and welcome to, to this webinar. Uh, just to introduce myself, so I'm Nicolas Kedar, I'm a Team Square computer engineer um, here in Lyon in France, and now I am one of the main developers of GitWare Slam algorithm. That's why I will be presenting today. Um, before beginning, I would like you just to check that you have access to the chat. Um, just to have access to the chat, maybe just say hello on the chat if you're ready and if you just to check that everything is working. And I encourage you to ask your questions whenever you have them and I will try to answer them as soon as possible during the presentation. So um, maybe you know Kitware, I think, because you're here today. Um, so Kitware has been developing uh, software uh, systems and software for more than 20 years now. Uh, it uh, represents more than 200 employees worldwide, and especially we are about 30 here in France, in Lyon, where I am currently located. Uh, Kitware is proud to be known for its uh, open source softwares, for in special visualization, such as VTK, Paraview, uh, also CMake, ITK, Slicer, and also LiDARView, the reason why uh, you are here today. So we are mostly developing uh, software, building blocks, toolkits, such as VTK for developers, but we are also developing some other full applications, such as Paraview, which are designed for end users, which have no experience in uh, coding and development. Uh, we like to see us as uh, people just playing with Lego, uh, developing a huge box of algorithm building blocks and just assembling them, models together, to build some specific applications. Uh, we both create uh, algorithm building blocks, such as, such as uh, the SLAM I will be presenting today, but we are also able to assemble these blocks together to build uh, full applications. Uh, these blocks can be, these applications can be also uh, specialized for your own needs, for your own applications, uh, and can be also proprietary to be adapted to your specific uh, needs. Kitwares offer a wide range of uh, software related services, uh, from consulting to design or audit a project, uh, to support contracts, making our experts uh, available as a hotline, or we also do full development for new features or new applications. Uh, in the end, software development is uh, the core of uh, Kitwell's activity. It represents more than 80% of our activity. And that's really the, the story, in fact, behind LiDAView and the SLAM I'm going to present today. So now, what is uh, LiDAView? Uh, these last years, uh, LiDAR sensors become more and more popular and affordable, uh, producing um, reliable and uh, more and more denser uh, pine clouds, 3D pine clouds, even in challenging environments, and that's why they can be useful. To easily receive and uh, uh, receive um, uh, the spine cards, uh, we built LiDAView. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. We are first present LiDAView, and after what is SLAM? How do we are able to, uh, to use this SLAM in LiDAView? Then I will present you how to run this SLAM in different environments, uh, such as uh, with different LiDAR sensors in different uh, scenes, indoor, outdoor, and how to use these different outputs and to export them for later use. So, what is LiDAView? LiDAView is a Paraview-based application. It has been uh, designed uh, initially by Kitware in 2013, as uh, initially released as VeloView, and has been designed for easily recording, replaying, and processing LiDAR data. Uh, quickly, this common code base become uh, a standard in the world of uh, LiDAR viewers and is now used by many different uh, LiDAR viewers, such as for, for Velodyne sensors, for Ulster, Opsys, Hezai, uh, and many others. For this reason, uh, Kitwa created LiDAView uh, two years ago uh, to have all this common code base, and we also incorporated a lot of experimental features in it to be able to make uh, LiDAView a rapid prototyping tool. So what is exactly the LiDAView? LiDAView, as I said, is a Paraview-based application. So there is Paraview behind the hood, which is in charge of uh, the rendering, all the, pro the um, pipeline architecture, all the viewing of uh, data. Then you have uh, the LiDAView stuff, really the core functionalities, 
on how to stream some LiDAR data, to record, to replay, to measure or process uh, the LiDAR point clouds. And on the other side, we have the interpreters. The interpreters are just plugins that are in charge of decoding raw device packets from different uh, LiDAR vendors uh, sensors, such as Velodyne, Hooster, Hildai, Opsys, and many others. And on the other side, we have all the experimental features that can be seen on the bottom of this slide. All these experimental features are either natively available in the code, in the LiDAR view source code, so that's the one you can see in blue. For example, you have some camera calibration tools or to calibration between camera and the LiDAR. You have also some machine learning tools, deep learning tools, or you have uh, the one I will be presenting today, the SLAM, which is uh, wrapped as a Paraview plugin. I say wrapped as a Paraview plugin because as many others, uh, Kitwa is just developing open source softwares in other repositories, and we're just wrapping this algorithm, this building box, this Lego blocks, for different softwares. For example, you can use it in ROS for those who are used to the, to the robot operating system, or you can use it in a Paraview plugin and so uh, in a leader view. To sum up, leader view is a rapid prototyping tool which can be used uh, to design your own applications and where you can, you can use uh, direct leads as a, a turnkey solution to uh, different, uh, different projects. Now, what is SLAM? SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. It's a generic family of algorithms. Uh, for example, you can have some image-based SLAM, uh, such as Orb SLAM, which is now uh, like image-based SLAM uh, exists for, for decades now. And more recently, you have some LiDAR SLAMs. Our, at Kitwe, uh, we initially uh, inspired our SLAM from uh, LOM, which is a LiDAR audiometry and mapping in real time uh, from uh, Zonganzing. And so it's a, a LiDAR SLAM, so its role is to estimate uh, the position and orientation of a LiDAR sensor in an unknown environment and to build at the same time a 3D map of this environment. This 3D map can be of a, seen as a 3D point cloud, such as the one you can see on this image in blue. Uh, in feature-rich environments, uh, such as in urban scene, as you can see here, it can even replace uh, costly GNSS or INS systems as it can produce reliable and really precise trajectories, like the one you can see in red. But why do we need, in fact, uh, SLAM? Because um, LiDAR are just outputting point clouds relatively to the position, the current position and orientation of the sensor. So to have just an idea, that's uh, the, the scans a LiDAR can produce can are on the left in white. So that is typically a LiDAR output, but you, for these two frames, you are not able to have any, yeah, like you don't, you don't have any position or orientation information of where this, these, these two frames were acquired from. And you don't have any information of where is uh, the second frame located compared to the first one. Therefore, you're not able to aggregate all these points together. That's the solution, that's why SLAM exists. The role of SLAM is to estimate at any time the trajectory of the LiDAR sensor by trying to registering extracted key points from the current frame onto the map uh, of key points. And then we'll be able to, uh, to build a map of the environments, the trajectory of the LiDAR, and to aggregate all points. Uh, if you want to have a look, uh, our SLAM is uh, so it's open source and is available so on the internet, so you can just access to the code if you want to use it. It's, uh, it's really available. It's released in the APH2 license, so you, you can use it. And you have some many information on this page, so you can just have a look if you want. You have the link, so uh, you're ready. Uh, on this uh, same web page, I've put some uh, binaries here on this page. You can just access it. And here I compiled some uh, LiDAR view uh, software, so with the SLAM support. So you just have to choose uh, the, the one you need, depending on your, your operating system. You have some instructions, maybe, depending on your system. And then after, just uh, run LiDAR view. So welcome in LiDAR view. So I'm proud to be uh, here with you. Um, before beginning, uh, you just need to uh, enable some uh, advanced features, so go in help tab. And also for later, we'll need some other information. So join and go in the view panel and enable the pipeline brother and also the properties. Now we are done, we are done and we can try to, to use now the SLAM in LiDAR view. So how do we use, do that? Oops, I'll just 
a little smaller. So to do that, as in Lidar view, you open, whoop, you open a dataset. So I will upload them uh, after the webinar, so you have access to all these datasets if you want to have a try by yourself. Open the set, select the LiDAR calibration that uh, corresponds to your environment. And now you see you have the LiDAR sensors. So the LiDAR point clouds. So uh, just to illustrate um, what uh, I said before, if I just try to aggregate, for example, the, the, the first frames of my LiDAR sensors, I can see that uh, they will just be aggregated uh, in a nonsense way because I don't have any information of uh, where are all the frames uh, located together. So how to run SLAM now? Just select the frame entry. You can just uh, color it by intensity. And after, you can just uh, select uh, the, the, so the frame entry and go into filters, alphabetical, and select the SLAM online uh, filter. If you want, you can just set uh, some parameters. For example, we just move uh, the number of parallel states to use. And then press apply and just press play. And that's all. You're all done. Now the stamp was just run by, uh, as you see, uh, estimating the uh, LiDAR trajectory, with you, which you can see in white here, and trying to register, so to estimate the transformation of where is the current LiDAR frame compared to, to the world. Uh, I can see that with uh, a question of what is the accuracy obtained from Kitwer stamp, uh, that's a good question. It's generally it's, uh, what we want. Um, it really depends on the environment, but as you will see with uh, this kind of uh, feature-rich environments, you can reach uh, a precision of, uh, I will say, 10, 10 centimeters upon maybe uh, 600 or 800 meters. So it's uh, really good in those environments. In indoor data sets, maybe you can reach also a uh, centimeter accuracy. Um, as you can see, so here I have different outputs to illustrate uh, what I was saying before. So as you are, in fact, in a PowerView-based application, you can also plot, hide, or show different outputs. So the SLAM has different outputs. For example, uh, there is a, uh, the current uh, register frame. You can have the trajectory uh, of the LiDAR, SLAM, the LiDAR sensor. And you can also plot uh, the edge of planar maps. Uh, why do I have two edge of planar maps? Because to work, the SLAM is extracting some key points from the current frame to limit, in fact, the number of points to consider and to be um, more reliable and also faster. So in this time, we extract mainly two types of key points, edge key points and planar key points. Edge key points are more like uh, the sharp uh, the geometrical parts in, uh, in our environment. It can be, for example, um, uh, lane, markings, lane markings, as you can see here. It can be the edge of some buildings it can be some pillars that you can see maybe uh, here. So it really depends. On the contrary, uh, planar key points are mostly flat surfaces. For example, you have the ground, you have the wall, and uh, all that stuff. With these two types of key points, we're able to limit uh, the size of the problem, and we're able to uh, rapidly estimate the motion of the LiDAR sensor. Uh, could we run SLAM in real time? Yes, as you can see on the top, uh, that's the frame rate, uh, so the, the, num the, the number of the frame I'm currently uh, processing. And as you can see, it's approximately playing at 10 hertz, which is uh, the, the speed of this LiDAR recording. So yes, it's able to run in real, in real time. But if you really want a real-time application, maybe uh, Paraview or LiDARView is not the, the well-suited application. Maybe I encourage you using, uh, for example, the, the RAS wrapping, which is more, um, well, uh, better designed for real-time applications in the robotic field. But yes, it can uh, run in real time. Uh, what is the time complexity? Uh, really, it depends because um, we extract a number of key points. So the number of key points is approximately 10% uh, of the number of points in the, in the full frame, in the full incoming frame. So if you are in a feature in feature-rich environment, you will have a lot of key points, but you will uh, do, like, the optimization will be easier and the, the environment will be easier too. Uh, there are also, as you may have seen, there are different filters. Uh, there were the SLAM online and the SLAM offline. What are the difference between both of them? Uh, the SLAM online, uh, as is the one selected right now, you will have um, 
and that would put a visualization of uh, the SLAM results at each new frame, each uh, process frame. The SLAM offline, on the contrary, will only display results at the end of the data set. So the algorithm behind the root is exactly the same, so the results will be the same. The only difference is that in one, uh, in one case, you will have some results during, and in other case, you will have the results in the end. So that was, as you can see, about the, the, the question before about the precision of the SLAM. You can see that uh, with about uh, um, uh, 700 meters uh, trajectory in this uh, neighborhood, in the end, we, we are able to ha arrive exactly at the same position at the beginning. As you can see, we had uh, a perfect loop without loop closing. And uh, even the objects, we, can, we don't see even uh, no duplicated objects. Uh, illustrating the fact that, in fact, the trajectory that has been computed is correct. So this was an example of a LiDAR mounted at top of a vehicle in a human dataset. But what, how does it uh, behave in other environments? Uh, for example, this is another dataset. So this is also uh, a VLP-16, a Vladine with uh, 16 laser channels. Uh, mounted on top of a vehicle, but this time it's not outdoor, but indoor. In fact, to be honest, this is in our Kitwa's underground parking. So welcome at home. Uh, as you can see, we are still able to run in real time and we are able to produce a reliable trajectory. Again, as you are in a, LIDAR, in a paraview based application, you can just um, uh, take the most of it if you want, for example, to, I don't know, to, to hide some outputs uh, or maybe if you want to uh, change uh, the color of uh, the, some outputs, you can do it. That's the advantage of uh, this uh, visualization, in fact, software with, uh, with the user interface. I did not talk much about the parameters, but if you want to have a look and try, there are many of parameters. Each of them can be... Uh, uh, extensively set, so there are also so a web page that will show you after to uh, set these parameters depending on, this, on, on the environment you're using. But all of them are available, and so you're able to adapt the SLAM to your data set and to your scene for your own needs to have the, the optimal precision. So here you can see, even uh, running in an indoor environment, we are also able, without tweaking any parameters, they are the same parameters as before, at the first data set, we're able to have a correct trajectory with a correct loop closing, and uh, so I it's okay. Uh, that was again a vehicle data set. How does it behave with other data sets? For example, this is a data set with another LiDAR sensor, a HDL, uh, an HDL32, which is mounted on a drone. So this is a, a much uh, difficult, uh, this is much more difficult because uh, UAVs uh, sometimes have uh, some very fast rotation motion and then we are not able, like, it's difficult to recover this motion because uh, with the fast rotation motions, they are really uh, difficult to, to register the new frame because uh, the point of view is really different. And so, as you can see, it's maybe difficult to aggregate later all points. But as you can see with this data set, for example, there is no problem to uh, rebuild uh, the, an outdoor map, uh, which is a quite a flat surface, of the environments with this uh, drone. A thing also that is uh, to notice is that uh, with uh, a drone, all points nearly lay, in fact, on the same flat plane, which is the ground, of course. And that's why it's difficult to extract maybe some key points or to have some reliable estimation of the, all the degrees of freedoms of um, our position and orientation. Also, another problem with the drone is that uh, you don't have a full uh, rotation point of view, a uh, full um, uh, spinning uh, point of view. You just have the, uh, a short field of view, which is uh, the, the points that are just lie on the ground. <coughs> if you have any question, again, uh, don't uh, just ask them as soon as you have them. Uh, maybe a last data set that I would like uh, to present to you is uh, again with another LiDAR sensor and it will be an indoor one. So this is the case with uh, a VL, uh, an alpha prime, so with a, a much uh, denser a much uh, denser output. So VLS uh, alpha prime, it's uh, 128 uh, laser rings. So really dense pine clouds. And to uh, change again 
the, um, to change again the, the type of environment, uh, I try to run so this lamb in an indoor scene. So this indoor scene, it's in our Kitwas office here in Lyon. And uh, just one of my colleagues just uh, held uh, the Alpha Prime sensor and just moved down in our offices. I just ran this lamp before uh, because uh, the machine I'm presenting right now is not powerful at all. So it was uh, a little difficult to, to run this lamp on it uh, with uh, this uh, high density uh, pine cloud, high density sensor. But uh, believe me, it's exactly the same algorithm with the same uh, parameters. So it, you can see the results here. Uh, this is a, so a high uh, reliable uh, uh, map, as you can see, so with a trajectory. As you can see, it's a pedestrian data set now. So the trajectory is uh, much less uh, smooth because uh, with a pedestrian, it's just moving in the LiDAR in uh, many different uh, orientation at, uh, at a high frequency with high frequency motion. So this is a, a much more difficult case to estimate uh, the trajectory. But we managed to uh, reliably estimate this trajectory and to build a 3D map of our Kitwas office. So welcome, and uh, for example, uh, right now I'm presenting from this room here. So to sum up, I present you a different kind of data sets. Uh, the first one is a human data set one uh, um, with a, uh, a sparse impact uh, sensor with just uh, 16 uh, laser rings in a feature rich environment, which is able to produce a, a high reliable uh, trajectory with a high precision. I also have some intermediary indoor outdoor data sets, so in, in underground parking, again with a VRT16 on a vehicle. But I am uh, also able to run these data sets on uh, outdoor with UIV uh, data sets, which are much more difficult with a diffi different sensor. This one is uh, with 32 uh, laser rings or a last data set, indoor data set, pedestrian data set with the 128 uh, laser rings. Uh, I have some other questions also about um, what registration method is being used in Kitwa Slam. So we have different parts. As I said, we extract some key points. Then we'll try to register this different type of key points depending on their of the, of the type. For example, we try to estimate some uh, point to, uh, to like for edge key points we'll try to estimate point to line matches and for plane uh, key points we'll try to estimate point to plane matches so this will be in some kind of uh, icp matches and then we'll optimize them using uh, the series solver which is a popular open source library and in the end we'll have to so we have a, a, a big problem with the several uh, lidar matches and we'll uh, optimize it to recover in the end uh, the current pose of the LiDAR, so which is a six, degree, six degrees of freedom uh, uh, problem with the three degrees of freedom for position about, um, on uh, X, Y, and Z, and also uh, three degrees of freedom for the orientation with the round, pitch, and U. Uh, it is based on LOAM. Yes, as I said before, like, like it is initially inspired from LOAM. So we use uh, the uh, initial article from Zhang Singh to inspire ourselves on the, on the how does uh, this time can work? So that's why uh, we have this idea of uh, splitting the extraction of edge and plane key points. But our code base has been totally uh, rewritten to be uh, more efficient, to be easily wrapped into ROS or PowerView. So the initial idea is the inspired from uh, LOAM, exactly. But now this code base is not at all the same. Uh, we have just coded, it, uh, all the coded uh, ourselves all the way. So no, it's not the same, and it will just will add some new features with time that we are developing. Uh, does it support non-rotating and solid-state lidar? Uh, right now, we just focused on spinning uh, lidars, so uh, such as uh, Velodyne, uh, Ustos one, also some Hezai ones. So that's uh, the one we have currently tested, also Robosense. Uh, it could work basically with other ones, such as uh, solid state or just. Um, uh, flash lidars, but we haven't uh, much uh, tried it yet already. You have just uh, running some internal tests. But you, if you're interested with this kind of features, you can just kind of do not hesitate to contact us and we'll try to, to work together, maybe to implement these new features or to adapt our stamp to these new sensors. Now, let me uh, just come back to our first data set. And what if we want to uh, use after to save maybe these outputs for later use? So what are these different outputs? As I said before, there are all of them. So we have the current registered frame, we have the trajectory, the key point maps, and the current extracted key points. 
how do we export these different uh, outputs? For example, the trajectory, we have different information. So of course, the position, uh, you can see uh, here that it is plotted. We have also the orientation. We have some time information of where was the LiDAR sensor at uh, each time. And also, uh, what is the uncertainty of uh, each degree of freedom? If you want to save now the trajectory, you can just select it in the entry, then go to Advanced, File, and Save Data. And here, after, you can just go uh, in the home, maybe uh, uh, select uh, a name of the file you want to save, and save it, for example, at the CSV file, uh, saving the time, role, pitch, show, and X, Y, Z position. Just press OK, and that's all. You're all done. Now, what about the others outputs? So as I said, um, if I just plot it here, the other ones, uh, the, the key points maps can be used, like they are the aggregation, the down sample aggregation of all key points extracted from previous frames. So it's not the aggregated uh, version of all points from all scans, it's just a down sample version, an internal representation that the SLAM is using to be able to, local to localize itself in the world. But it can be use, uh, useful because it uh, provides a, a, a nice lightweight and uh, with a lot of uh, sense of the world. So if you want to save it, it's possible to, to do that. Just select the uh, edge map entry, for example, and go into Advanced, File, Save Data, or press Control S. Then after you can select uh, the, the type of uh, format you want. For example, it can be a, a general uh, CSV file format. It can be a VTP if you use the power view. PLY for more classical uh, fi point cloud file formats, or also LAS, which I'll be talking about uh, later. Same thing, just press OK, and that's all. So that provides uh, the way to save a trajectory or edge or planar map. But what now if you, this representation, this visualization is not enough for you, and you want to aggregate all points from all scans? It is possible to. To do that, for example, just uh, from select uh, the, the current uh, transformed frame, um, we want to aggregate all the points from all the previous frames. To do that, you have to select the trailing frame entry. The trailing frame entry, as you said, this is without using the SLAM trajectory. I just uh, displayed the 100 last LiDAR frames. As you can see, as I said before, as I don't have any information of where is located the LiDAR sensor at each time, at each frame, I'm not able to register them together. And that's why uh, all these frames are just uh, displaying in a nonsense way. But now I have computed my SLAM trajectory, so I can use it maybe to aggregate all these points together. And yes, exactly, it's possible. To do that, select the trailing frame entry, and you can Im uh, instantiate a temporal transform applier filter. Select the point cloud entry, the trailing frame. For the trajectory, select the SLAM trajectory that you just uh, computed. Press apply, if you wait a few seconds. And now our key points, our uh, old points from our previous uh, 100 frames are aggregated in a cool fashion way. And now you have access to a, a high density pine cloud where you can see really uh, some smart details. For example, uh, you can see uh, the, the, the plane, the, the pillars, you can even see the electric lanes, for example, you can see here. So you can after use this visualization for your own support, or you can also export it. So to export it, just select the, uh, the, the output, and the uh, same thing, press Control S, for example, and select uh, the output that you want to use. But be careful, because uh, just to remember, a LiDAR uh, sensor is outputting a lot of points. For example, uh, in one second, it's approximately outputting uh, a million points. A million points, it's a lot. So imagine with, uh, for example, this uh, two minutes data set, uh, this represents in the end a several gigabytes data sets, a gigabyte uh, pine cloud. So that may not fit into your machine memory depending on your machine specifications. And then uh, sadly it could crash because it's not uh, the best way to do it. There is another way to do it also. You can just append all these points directly into a file, for example, a last file. And in this way, you will not have the visu visualization of the whole point cloud because that is all the points, not to have uh, the whole point cloud in memory. So we'll be able to use it later, the whole aggregated points. I will not have time to show you uh, how to do that uh, right now, but all these informations are also available uh, in our uh, GitLab web page, where you can see in the, in the bottom of the page, there is a kind of a summary, in fact, of this uh, webinar on how to slam with LiDAR view. 
where you have many information on how to, a reminder of how to use SLAM in MetaView, on how to export the, so the, the, the trajectory, the maps, and how also to aggregate here all the points directly into a last file. There is also a last section about how to tune the parameters depending on the environment type, for example, if you're in outdoor, indoor scene, or in a pure geometric scene, or with a lot of invariants, such as in corridor, in field, in highway, or forest, etc. And also depending on the mobile platform that is currently carrying the LiDAR sensor. For example, it could be a vi vehicle, which is a kind of a very, really, really smooth trajectory, but generally with fast motion, on a drone, uh, so with a fast motion, a high frequency motion, and a not as, uh, as good smooth trajectory, or a pedestrian data set, which is much more difficult because it's a high frequency motion, uh, moving a lot in an indoor scene where you have a, a lot of occlusions. So I, I encourage you to follow also this tutorial if you have some questions. It can be a, a good starting point if you want to use uh, this slam uh, for your applications. Uh, I see that I have also a question about um, uh, if there are loop closure. Uh, right now, currently in this uh, slam I'm presenting, there is no loop closure. So it's uh, quite impressive because you can have some, with only a dead recording, with only odometry, we are still able to recover a really precise trajectory. But we are currently working and we want to add, that, to add loop closure because it's really useful, in, for example, in indoor data sets when you have a lot of loops. So if you're interested with it, uh, again, you can just contact us. We'll, um, we will be pleased to work with you and to use it later for your applications. Uh, just as a reminder also, uh, this trajectory here, and as all the, the data set I presented, is just using LiDAR data. We don't have any IMU or GPS or images, anything. No, just LiDAR data, and we're just using it. So just to sum up uh, what we've seen together on the how to, to slam with the LIDA view, uh, we have seen what is LIDA view, uh, what is slam, how to use slam in LIDA view. We have seen uh, how to run slam in different in scenarios, in different environments, with different LIDAR sensors, with different uh, environments, with different platforms. And we have seen also how to export uh, the slam outputs. So thank you for being there. Uh, again, if you want to, to work together, uh, we'll be pleased to, to adapt uh, the Slam code base for you. Uh, again, it's freely available. It's open source, so you can uh, already use it. Um, it's uh, open source, so you can use it. And uh, if you have any questions now, I will be pleased to answer them. And uh, thank you for watching. So do not hesitate to ask any question if you have some. Um, if you have some other questions, oh, uh, all the, is uh, all the data kept into memory? Uh, it depends. Uh, for example, if I'm just uh, talking about the, the, the key points maps, in this case, uh, yes, the key points maps are stored into memory. Uh, that's why we need to dense up all uh, the input points, because if we are considering all the points, this will grow bigger. It's, uh, in, in fact, we'll just reach a uh, the same problem with aggregating all the points. It will present a maybe million, a hundreds of millions of points, and that's too much. So yes, we used a downsampled uh, version of the maps. As you can see, there is a kind of resolution. For example, for the planar map, we only have uh, one point every 50 or 60 centimeters. So this will allow, allow us to have some more um, uh, uh, more global features representing a plane at this particular position. So we'll maybe um, uh, filter outlier points. And this will have also the effect to have a much smaller map in memory. For example, this kind of maps is just uh, maybe a few megabytes. So it's still uh, largely tractable and scalable for bigger data sets. It's uh, also possible to save all the key points if you want directly on file on disk. So it won't be in memory and you will be able to use it for later use. Um, does it work in a multi-LIDAR setting? Uh, example, one, LIDAR, one LIDAR on the front and one LIDAR on the back. Um, currently, uh, it is developed, in fact, in the, in the core uh, LIDAR SLAM uh, library that we have been developing. So yes, it's supported in the core uh, C++ library, but it's not supported yet in LIDAR view. I said yet because we are also working on it and we'd like to have it uh, as soon as possible. 
but uh, if you want to use it on the RAS wrapping, it's totally possible. Uh, you can set a different number of uh, LIDARs by just saying, for example, the, the transform, um, the calibration between the different LIDARs, where is located one sensor compared to the other one. You can just set a different uh, kind of uh, um, key points extraction parameters, for example, if you have, they have some different uh, properties. And then we'll just merge the, uh, all the key points from these different sensors together, and they will be used uh, um, during the same optimization process to be able to recover uh, with a better precision the, the, the LiDAR trajectory. So uh, we do support uh, the multi-LiDAR setting in ROS and in the core data slam uh, library, not yet in LiDAR view, but we will. And uh, still about this uh, multi-LiDAR setting, it's particularly a good idea, for example, in indoor data sets, where you could have an horizontal uh, LiDAR, for example, and you would like to see also on the top or on the side, so you can imagine Im exactly having a horizontal LiDAR and a vertical one. Uh, have we tested uh, 3D SLAM with the VLP says mounted on horizontal uh, when using stairs indoors? Um, I don't have any data sets. Uh, if you have some to share with us, uh, we'll be pleased to test it uh, for you, or maybe you can just try yourself uh, now that you have all the clues to, to run this slam uh, yourself. But uh, yes, this is a difficult uh, use case, for example, because we have a lot of invariance, because it's difficult to localize ourselves on where, uh, on which stair we are at each timestamp. But as long as you have any, maybe, I don't know, uh, floor or ground information, uh, maybe you have uh, so the, the sailing, I don't know, or some other things, or uh, some windows, or maybe you have some writings on the walls because our um, key points extractor is also using uh, the intensity gaps uh, to detect edges or uh, points. Yes, it could be perfectly possible to localize ourselves precisely. Another solution would be uh, not to use just LIDAR data. So I say that this time is currently only using LIDAR data, but for example, using uh, ADIMU, it would be perfectly possible to have a, a prior, an hypothesis or of uh, where is our current LiDAR frame uh, located, and we'll then be able to use the other LiDAR matches to precisely register in the corridor or in the stairs to be able to, precise to, localize, uh, to locate ourselves. Um, which features are the most important? So as you may uh, have been able to, to see, there are different kinds of uh, key points. So I told about edge uh, key points, about planar key points. Maybe let's go back to the, this uh, data set. So we have different kinds of key points. So the edges one, which are really uh, uh, extracting uh, the edge of the buildings. For example, you can see this house here. Uh, the intensity gaps like the lane markings. Uh, we have also some pillars or some uh, electric lanes here. So they are, these edge key points are useful to extract uh, some uh, straight lines information, some sharp edge information. So they will um, help optimization by just uh, reducing the uncertainty in uh, one along one translation, which is the, trans uh, the, the orientation, in fact, of our edge. So they are really useful, for example, in forest, when you have a, a lot of trees, in indoor environments, where you can have some pillars or wedges, everything. Planar key points are very, very widely used. We have a lot of key points because in our, uh, on Earth, generally, even if you are, uh, maybe not if you are in space, but normally you have a ground. So you have a ground surface. And so ground surface um, can be used to already optimize three degrees of freedom. So the Z elevation and also the roll and pitch. So planar key points are necessary generally. You, you cannot uh, ignore them. Uh, edge can also be used to, um, after to uh, um, register the edge on this plane because you don't know the orientation. For example, you don't know the, the yo orientation with just planar key points, with just the ground plane key points. But in a human environment when you, or indoor where you have some walls, you have uh, the sailing also, uh, just planar key points could be theoretically be enough. As you can see, there are also some blob key points uh, by default, they are not used in our slam. You can enable them by just enabling the, the use blobs option. This is really advised to use them when you are in diffi difficult situations. For example, you have some mobile objects, or if you don't have, in fact, not many planar or edge key points, for example, if you, in your, if you are in fields or on a highway when you just have maybe uh, the road, but you don't know where you are on the road, and maybe you can help uh, 
extracted some blob key points on the, the bushes on the side. So in this kind of situations, blobs key points could be useful, but it will be slower because we'll extract some more key points and they are generally less reliable. So the, the optimization will be a bit slower and maybe less efficient. But sometimes in some uh, environments, this is maybe the, the only solution in the end to be able to precisely locate ourselves. Uh, so which are the most important? Uh, consider always using planar ones, edges one too, because uh, we have less edges key points, so it's uh, kind of uh, not memory free, but it's uh, more, uh, more um, uh, greedy, uh, less greedy. So use them too, but uh, just keep the default settings without using the blob points uh, and just use them if you need to. Uh, when the LIDAR, when the LIDAR is mounted at an angle, uh, say uh, 55, 45 degrees around Z, should I first transform to Z up? Uh, well, you can, but there is no prior on, the, on this SLAM algorithm on how is mounted uh, the LIDAR sensor. And that's a great strength, because in many um, other codes or many applications, generally you have to set uh, the LIDAR position and orientation, and then there's a prior, for example, that say uh, the LiDAR will be moving around the y-axis. Uh, here there is not. We are just, we'll just use, the, for example, the previous motion to see in which direction we were moving previously. But there is no such prior of uh, we need to move absolutely in the y or x direction compared to the previous frame. So no, you don't really need to uh, transform the frame. You can. But uh, it if you are just uh, doing that for visualization purposes, uh, for example, uh, for the, 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 the drone one, you can see that uh, our, uh, my incoming frame, up, if I just disable all the height, all the outputs, uh, is, not in, is not in the same um, uh, frame because uh, there's this coordinates, the LiDAR is mounted, uh, like the, the axis of the LiDAR is horizontal. So either or you have two choices. Either you can transform, for example, so using a transform filter when you can uh, just check after, uh, set the orientation correctly. Or if you want, directly in the SLAM, there is a parameter that allows you to change to like to, to set what is the calibration of the LIDAR sensor compared to, to the base, to the, the frame you want to track on the mobile platform. And you are able to set it. So in the ad, just check that the, the advanced features are toggled with, with a little G. And you can set, the, as you can see, the base to LiDAR transform. And what, that's what I've done here by setting a rotation of minus 90 degrees around the y-axis. So it's not used to have better uh, performances because it will just behave the same. It just used in the end to be able to uh, aggregate, to have the, the map uh, in the, to have the, to have the map in the correct uh, uh, ground aligned uh, frame coordinates. So it's just used for that. Uh, how does it perform in dynamic environments? Uh, does it, are, you, are we relying on uh, stable key points? Um, that's the difficulty. It's always difficulty in, uh, with dynamic uh, mobile objects. For example, you can have some cars, you can have some pedestrians. Uh, it really depends uh, on the uh, surrounding environment, or on the static environment. For example, in such urban uh, environment, we have uh, some uh, mobile objects. For example, we can see here a car that just moved. We can see some other cars here. One, park, one car was uh, parking and there was some other one coming in the other way. Here we, have a, we had a lot of cars on the road too. So if we have some other features, if we have so many other key points on the walls, on the surrounding buildings, on the, on the ground, it won't be a problem. We'll be able to rely on all the key points in order to be able still to optimize, to ignore in fact uh, this uh, faulty outliers and just keep the inliers one to be able after to, to locate precisely. The problem is um, sometimes more in like, uh, for example, on, on highway, when you don't have the environment is generally not very good because you have maybe just the highway, you have maybe some uh, grass on the sides, but you don't have anything else and you have a, a strong uh, uncertainty on the, the translation alongside the road. And those kind of situations, uh, the dynamic objects could be a problem because uh, the SLAM could, uh, in fact, um, uh, attach to the incoming objects. And then it could maybe uh, uh, just um, uh, not move correctly. In this kind of situations, as I said, we can enable blob points to have more key points, and then it will be enough to ignore the outliers points. Sometimes it's not enough, and in these situations, 
I encourage you to use another sensor, for example, IMU or maybe wheel odometry if you're using a vehicle to incorporate that to the optimization and be able to, after, correctly uh, ignore the moving objects. But just to be clear, maybe uh, that was exactly the question, uh, we don't have any uh, moving objects uh, removal. Uh, so the key points are extracted from each frame independently from the previous ones. So maybe that's what the question, I'm not exactly sure. Um, have we tried pure localization uh, with these maps uh, and evaluated its accuracy relatively to the map? Uh, I'm not sure of uh, what is meaning here. Uh, maybe it was just uh, the question about uh, maybe uh, running uh, like you know, running the slam once and then having a map and then after trying to localize after in this map. If that is the question, yes, we have tried it. So it was mainly, uh, so for example, the in forest data sets with the vehicle data sets where we were just uh, moving around with slam, generating a map. And then after we're able to fix the map. So this was not done in data view, but with the ROS uh, uh, wrapping. So we can just fix the map after and localize only by keeping this map static and localize in this map. So this is totally possible. This has the advantage of uh, that maybe if you clear the, your maps uh, before, you can maybe remove all the outliers of the mobile objects. You can maybe uh, modify the map if you want to move some points or to add some. If you want to georeference your map, it's also possible. So in this kind of situations, yes, you, you can just uh, run the slam in uh, only uh, uh, localization mode only. However, be careful if you had some uh, mobile objects, uh, if your environment wasn't static, uh, there is a risk that the map does not correspond to reality and to current, um, to current in fact, uh, environments. So in this kind of situations, you could have some uh, worse performances than the first one. But on the contrary, if you don't have any mobile objects at the beginning, but you have some in the second run, then in this case, it's really good because in fact, you won't have after any mobile object polluting the map. So we'll just ignore the key points on the incoming frames. And as you are just localizing on the map, you won't use there's a mobile objects uh, key points. So in this kind of situation, it can be really uh, a, a good point. Uh, do we combine a LiDAR with image recognition? Uh, right now, this LiDAR, this uh, SLAM, no, because it's just using LiDAR data, but it's totally possible to combine after a LiDAR data with an uh, image, uh, of, of, with a, a video, for example, a video uh, a streaming to have some, for example, color information, or as you said, we can do some image recognition, for example, using deep learning on the image base, uh, so with uh, the yellow, something like that. So we could be able to uh, detect some cars, detect some pedestrians, uh, in brief, just to have a, a segmentation of our uh, image and to have then after to reproject, for example, our LiDAR points on these images to add the label to, the, to our LiDAR points. And we have already done that. So this is not in the slam, but it's totally possible to use it, to do it, even uh, in some LiDAR view uh, uh, toolkits, LiDAR view experimental features that I presented before, it is possible. The only only thing to do, in fact, is just to know the calibration of between uh, of your camera, of your camera, of course, and also the extra sync calibration between your lidar sensor and your camera sensor. In this case, you will be able to correctly project all points in uh, each coordinate systems and to uh, reproject after the, the label, the, the classification of each point in uh, for four lidar points. So yes, and in the end, you will be able to have a, a 3D point cloud such as uh, this one with, uh, for example, uh, trees labeled, uh, houses, cars, pedestrians, uh, grass, and everything. We have some videos uh, about uh, these demos, if you want. So maybe uh, we would publish it uh, later on the, the webinar page, if, uh, if that fits to you. But yeah, we definitely have some demos of this kind of stuff. If you are interested with this, uh, maybe you can just contact us also if uh, you have some applications uh, around uh, this type of projects. Uh, how fast is the matching algorithm and what can be the, mass, the max speed of uh, the base? Again, this depends on the environment. For example, uh, well, about the, 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 the speed of the algorithm. For example, with uh, the VLP16, so it's uh, quite um, a sparse uh, LiDAR sensor. Um, on my laptop, uh, the slab is just running in approximately uh, like, like less than 20 milliseconds. 
So it's far, uh, it's far above real time because real time it's a 100 milliseconds for this kind of data sets. So 20 milliseconds, it's fast. So this was, I think it was uh, for this kind of data set in urban uh, feature rich uh, environments. Uh, for other sensors, for example, if you consider some 32 laserings, uh, it's uh, slower because you have some more points or more key points and uh, some more matches and uh, longer optimization, but it's always real time. Uh, even uh, if it's not real time, I mean, if it's, uh, if, if it's uh, the processing is more than 100 uh, milliseconds uh, for a 10 hertz uh, spinning sensor, the SLAM will just skip some frames, but it's not a problem because you are still able to precisely localize yourself and to build a reliable map, even if you skip some frames. So it's possible. Um, about um, what can be the, the max speed of the base, uh, it depends on the, of the base, in fact. For example, if it's a vehicle, uh, it's a quite smooth, um, smooth motion. So you are able to extrapolate uh, the previous motion and to have a, a correct prior of uh, where I should be located. For example, here I was here at this point and I know that uh, when this new frame here is uh, received, I know that approximately if I'm following the same motion as before, I have moved approximately of, uh, I don't know, one meter from uh, the previous frame. So we have run uh, our SLAM on highway uh, at about uh, 90, uh, 90 kilometers per hour. So it was possible and we succeeded to, uh, to run our SLAM, but it was in feature-rich environments or, or maybe not in a uh, human environment, but with trees, with uh, some buildings and uh, some pillars and electric lanes and everything. So it's possible. Uh, on the other side, uh, with a drone, maybe it can be much more complicated because you have a more fast rotational motion. So 90 kilometers per hour, it's a lot for a drone, so uh, I don't guess, uh, I don't think you can uh, just uh, accede uh, to, to this kind, kind of speeds. But um, as soon as you, maybe, uh, maybe you can just have a, a, a rapid translation, but the rotation should be slower. So if you are able to uh, decrease uh, the, the rotational rate, yes, you could reach some quite important speeds. I don't have any uh, idea, maybe I, I would say about 20, 30 kilometers per hour. For pedestrian data sets, uh, I, I don't guess, uh, I don't think you can run at 30 kilometers per hour uh, with a LiDAR sensor mounted on top of you. But uh, normally if you just uh, walk or maybe run with uh, the LiDAR, it won't be a problem. The problem with the uh, pedestrian data sets is just that you have some high frequency motion. So again, if you're running, normally you're approximately running in a, in a straight way, so it will be easier. If you're just walking and moving the LiDAR in all directions, even if you are not uh, changing your position, but just changing the orientation, in fact, this kind of data sets which be, will be much more complicated. Um, could you tell us a bit about the RAS wrapper? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, so our RAS wrapping, so it's using the core SLAM C++ library and we have built on top of it uh, all the um, uh, two different wrappings. So if you want just, uh, for example, have a, uh, a screenshot. So this is our, our SLAM uh, that's run on the same data set, you see, but this time on RAS, so you can maybe recognize uh, the, the, the color map and the frames. Um, so we have the core LIDAR SLAM library and then we are able to, to build on top of it a Rust node, a set of Rust nodes that are just using, built upon on this uh, LiDAR SLAM lib and uh, to uh, enable the use of this SLAM at the Rust node. So this uh, Rust node can be uh, heavily configured with a YAML config file and you can use it. Uh, I want to specify also that uh, it's using uh, Rust1 uh, right now. So currently, because uh, we only had some projects to use it on Rust1, but if, we, if you want us to maybe um, adapt it to Rust2, it's totally possible too. Um, please note also that uh, the Rust mapping is uh, already using some of the same algorithm stuff, so it may be a bit faster because the Rust is, is designed for real-time applications, real-time uh, robotic and mapping applications. And also, it's not uh, really in charge of the visualization, uh, visualization tasks. In fact, the visualization is done in all the processes, for example, the, by Avis. So it's uh, separated from the, really the, the SLAM run. Uh, on the contrary, and in LIDAR view, LIDAR view, the same LIDAR view application is running at the same time the SLAM algorithm and at the same time in charge of uh, decoding LIDAR data and visualizing. So 
it's um, running several tasks at the same time in the same process. So you, you, it's not uh, for designed for the same applications. About the license, all our code is uh, released upon the, on the APH2 license. So independently, if it's uh, the ROS lib, if it's uh, the ROS wrapping or the power review wrapping. So it means that you can use this code as long as you keep the copyright and headers and license files. Uh, is there local and global optimization? Uh, right now, there is only local optimization. So what does that mean for the, the other ones? That means that uh, we are only using some uh, autometry. In fact, you know, we are just uh, playing, we are just using a dead recording. It means that we are just trying to register each new frame on the map. Each new, we're trying to estimate the position of a LiDAR sensor just using the previous one. And uh, after that, we have uh, add, in fact, this uh, pose to the trajectory. The trajectory is fixed and cannot be modified. So this is the current state, but we are also working, so as I said, on adding loop closure. So with adding loop closure the, uh, for the other one, it means that we're able, for example, we'll just come back at this uh, position, or maybe it uh, can be a bit uh, more evident with this kind of data sets, where we just uh, started here. And when we come back uh, after the loop, we just recognize the environment, and then we're able to say, hey, uh, we have already seen this point, and even if I had some drift, I'm able to correct now this drift to, uh, by adding a new uh, constraint between two pairs. And in this case, I have to optimize my previous trajectory with a global optimizer. So right now, there's just local uh, optimization, but we are also working on loop closure and in the end uh, to add a global optimization. Uh, UAV or carrying the sensor is the most uh, challenging uh, since we assume constant velocity. Um, it depends. Uh, maybe pedestrian is more complicated. Well, it, it depends, in fact, your data set. But for example, with uh, this data set, UAV, uh, the translation is quite smooth and the rotation, uh, we, like we're not um, uh, turning at the same time as we are moving in translation. So it depends your data sets. Uh, the advantage of drones, it's like, um, it's still a continuous and quite smooth uh, motion. It's a fast motion, but quite smooth. So you could be able to have a, a nice um, um, ego motion model to be able to extrapolate where you are in the new incoming frame. On the contrary, on pedestrian data sets, uh, you may, especially if you are just holding the LiDAR with your hand, you may move in any direction uh, very fast. If you just move, uh, tweak the, the LiDAR in any direction, it can move the very fast and then the point cloud can just have a, maybe a 100 degrees uh, the different orientation than before. So drone can be complicated because it's fast, but it still have the kind of smooth uh, motion model. Have we tried uh, carrying a sparse sensor like VLP says on a VLP 16 on, on a pedestrian? Uh, yes, totally. Uh, I don't have some data sets right now to show you with it, but yes. Uh, in fact, to be honest, this LAM was initially designed uh, for sparse data sets. Uh, we can see a lot in the literature some um, uh, SLAM uh, algorithm which are focusing on uh, really higher, de like denser uh, sensors, for example, Alpha Prime or HDL64. But we decided to focus at the beginning on uh, lighter and uh, sparse uh, sensors because they are less, uh, much more cheaper, so uh, much more uh, widespread compared to the others. So, yeah, we are mainly using, in fact, VLP16, to be honest, or maybe HDL32 or VLP32. And we have tried it on uh, indoor or outdoor with a pedestrian uh, case. Um, again, remember that uh, if you are in paraview, as you are in leader view, it is based on paraview. So you have access to all, in fact, or, or most of the paraview stuff. So if you want to add some filters, if you want to change the color map, to change uh, the visualization, if you want to change uh, the size of the points, if you want to change uh, the, the display and everything you want, it is possible. And you have also access to all the filters in Paraview. Uh, I would like to say also that uh, as you, you, you may see, uh, this uh, code base is really active. Uh, you can see we are just committing a lot of uh, new features uh, every day, every week. So if you want to have some new features, you can just contact us at any time and we'll try to add them uh, with time. Uh, we don't have IMU support right now, but we are working definitely on it. 
to be able to have, uh, for example, for, for drone data sets, to be able to use this uh, maybe gravity information or just to have uh, uh, an idea to integrate the acceleration or rotation rates to have an idea of uh, how did we move since last frame. So we don't have it right now, but yes, we definitely want to add this INU support in our SLAM. Uh, so in either view and in uh, the ROS uh, wrapping, we can we'll do it on both. So we are currently working on it, and especially uh, nowadays. So yes, we we will be able to add IMU uh, information in the, in our SLAM. Uh, now I guess you have all the the tools for you, uh, so you will be able to to produce some uh, beautiful images like that. You, you have every, everything with you. Uh, so this is the same data set I will share with you. You know how to run SLAM, you know how to aggregate frames, you know how to save them. So yes, you will be able to run uh, everything uh, as you need and as you want. Um, thanks uh, for all this webinar, for attending, for being uh, so many uh, today with me and uh, with us, with Kitware. So I would like to thank you for being here and uh, I hope uh, you will be able to, to use uh, this lamb. I will read this, uh, this data set and so all the binaries so that you, uh, you will be able to, to use them on your side. And uh, thanks for being there. And uh, if you have any questions, if you have uh, any projects that you want to, to work with us, do not hesitate to, to contact us. Thanks again and have a good day.